tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So the Lord had created all things. He had put the man and the woman in the garden. He had given this one command, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And with that context set for us, that brings us to Genesis chapter 3. And just by one final word of introduction, Pastor Dan mentioned this at the outset of the sermon, but it's been a difficult week this week with a couple of sudden deaths within the congregation. That has been um, on my heart as we have lost two members very suddenly, one of whom was an employee here for many years. And I think that in that context, it is especially comforting for us to remember that Jesus Christ is our hope. In the midst of any struggle or pain or hardship that we face, Jesus Christ is our hope. And so I'm so thankful that we can be together today and that we can remind each other of the fact that Jesus is our hope. So let's give our attention to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's start by praying together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you for all of the words contained in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. We pray that as we consider them, that you might remind us of the hope that you bring. We pray that we might celebrate that hope during Advent. And we pray that we would realize that our hope is in Jesus. Lord, we pray that if anything that I say doesn't come from you, please let it fall to the ground and pass away and be forgotten. And we pray that everything that is from you, please let that remain All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When God made the world, He made it good. He made it to be without sin. He made it to be without death. Do you know why there was no death in the world when the Lord created it? Because there was no sin. Sin's best friend is death. We're told in the New Testament that sin, when it's fully grown, it gives birth to death. Wherever sin is, death is close behind. They are best friends they have been from the very beginning. That's what's on display here in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. It's a great tragedy wherein the three great enemies that you and I face are seen, and they come into the world. 
And we also see that there's one great hope that's promised for us and laid out for us in Genesis chapter 3. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about a great tragedy. We'll be talking about our three great enemies. And we'll be talking about the great hope. The great hope. That's what we'll be talking about today. So let's jump right into it and let's talk about a great tragedy, which is what we find here You see, Genesis chapter 3 is a bleak story. It's a dark story. The story of sin and death entering into the world is most likely the darkest story that we read in the Old Testament. And it's made all the more bleak by the fact that this dark story enters into the world at a time where there had been brightness and light. God had created the world. He had created it good. And as the crowning achievement of His creation, He had created humanity and placed them in the garden, His very image there in the garden in the world that He had made. And the Lord looked at all He had made, and at the end of it He says, this is very Good. What God had made was not just good, it was very good. A world free from the stain of corruption. A world without sin. A world without death. And the Lord gave a duty to perform, to work the garden and to keep it. And He gave one command. Eat from any tree except for this one. One command. Think about that. When I think about this, this doesn't seem like all that challenging of a command to keep. You can eat anything you want, just avoid one little bit of fruit. All right, God, that's fine. I'll avoid this fruit from this tree. That doesn't seem like too hard of a command. Not to me. I'm hoping not to you also. But here's the reality, is that the way that the man and the woman respond to this is they seem to be hanging near this one tree that they were commanded not to eat from. And I think that this is the human tendency that seems to be at play here. I'm guessing for those of you who have children, I haven't experienced this yet, but I've heard that this happens if you say, hey, you can have anything in the kitchen to eat except for these pretzels. The kids are going to want the pretzels. And that's what seems to be the case here with the man and the woman. I had a pastor friend who who had a well-trained dog, and they went and visited a family's uh, home, and and he said to the dog, you can go this far away from the house. He said there was a lot of place for that dog to play, but what did he do? He kept prowling just the border of where he was allowed to go because he wanted to get as close as possible to the thing he wasn't allowed to do without, without going past it, right? And that seems to be a tendency. And that seems to be at play here with the man and the woman because the serpent's there and says, hey, how about you eat this? And then they look and they see that the fruit is good to eat. It seems like they are right there in the presence of the tree that they're told not to eat from. And then the story of tragedy happens. Sin and death come to play within the world, and you see see it at play immediately, don't you? You see the fact that sin and death come into the world, and that sin immediately harms relationships between the man and the woman and between humanity and God. Verse 8, we're told, The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Isn't that tragic? The Lord comes to walk in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and the woman hide. They hide from their Lord. They hide from their Creator. They hide from their hope. And in so doing, they kind of reveal the tendency of every human heart. Our tendency is to want to run and hide from our God. To run and hide from the one who loves us, who made us, who created us for fellowship with him, who created us to enjoy him forever. And yet the tendency of the human heart is to run away and hide. And then there is a, a stin, a, the sin leaving a stain on the relationship between humans. God seeks out Adam and Eve and he says, why are you hiding and And Adam says, well, when we heard you, we realized that we were naked, and and so we hid. And the Lord God says, well, who told you that you were naked? And Adam says, well, you know, the woman's really the problem. The human tendency, this woman thou gavest me, 
She's really the problem. You're really the problem. You're the one that put her here. And then the woman said, you know, it's the serpent. No, he, he's the one that, that did it. Immediately, there's a shifting of the blame. The man blames the woman. The woman blames the serpent. And you can see that there is conflict that right now exists within the relationship between man and woman. There's a death that's come to their relationship. It's a death that's been brought by sin. And so sin immediately sows discord between God and humanity, between the man and the woman. Sin immediately is bringing a kind of death to these relationships. Sin always does. This is a tragedy. And do you know why this is such a tragedy? Because Genesis 3 introduces our our three great enemies. And that's our second point, is these three great enemies. The first great enemy is the devil, is Satan. The serpent here is no mere snake. Revelation chapter 20 verse 2 helps us understand who the serpent is. We're told in Revelation chapter 20 verse 2, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan. We see our first great enemy on display here in Genesis chapter 3. And notice the way that he is our enemy through the way he operates within this passage. He is a tempter. He tempts the woman and the man to disobey the Lord's rule. He tempts them to engage in that which seems good, but it creates destruction. They take a look at the fruit that he tempts them to eat, and and it looks so good. It looks good for food. And this is the way that temptation always works. And remember this well, whenever you are tempted, there is a real spiritual evil that is at play with every temptation. There is a real spiritual evil that's at play in every temptation. This is the way that evil looks. It takes something that the Lord says a very good no to, and it says, you know that thing that the Lord says no? Why don't you just do it? I mean, it looks so good. Why not just engage? Evil always makes something terrible appear appealing. Be on guard. This is the way that the enemy works. The enemy will take what is bad and will make it appear appealing. Or maybe he will take something that is appealing and encourage you to misuse it so that it becomes terrible. This, Be on guard. There is a real spiritual power at play in temptation. Our enemy is a tempter. Our enemy, the devil, is a divider. We talked about it already, but immediately there is a division between God and humanity. Immediately there is a division between humanity itself. The Spirit of God always creates unity. Where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of God is, there is unity. But the enemy, the enemy always creates unity disunity. That's actually the root of the word devil itself. Diabolos is one who breaks apart. The devil always creates disunity. And so we see in this tragedy the effects of the devil's work as there is a breach between God and humanity and a breach between the man and the woman because this is the way that the devil works. Creating disunity. And the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. You won't die, he tells the man and the woman. You won't die. In fact, you're going to be like God. All you've got to do is, is try this fruit, and if you just taste it, you're going to be just like God, knowing good from evil. He is keeping this from you because he doesn't want you to be like him. He said you're going to die. That's not going to happen. That was a lie. The devil is a liar and has been a liar from the beginning. And this is the way that the enemy always works, through lies and deception. Don't believe them and don't join the devil in lies or deception because this is the way that the enemy has worked from the beginning. A liar from the very beginning. And the devil will continue to speak lies. The enemy will continue to speak lies. You might need Jesus, but you need something else as well. You need a backup plan. 
by. Your spouse doesn't deserve you. Why not just look? Lies. The devil is a liar from the beginning. Don't believe. Don't believe what the enemy has to say. Our first great enemy is on display here in Genesis chapter 3, as is our second. The second great enemy is sin. Sin comes into the world as Adam and Eve eat the fruit of the tree, into the good world which God created, into a world that was free from sin and free from corruption. Sin and corruption now rush into the scene. This is a tragedy. And sin is a big deal. Sin is cosmic treason. R.C. Sproul reminds us of this in a very helpful way. At a recent Ligonier conference in 2014, he was asked this question. He was asked, Since God is slow to anger and rich in mercy, why was the punishment for Adam's sin so severe? And his response is very good. He said, This creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God. After that, God had said, the day of which you eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying that day, he lived another day and was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of the curse applied for some time on him. But the worst curse would, co- would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman, and the punishment was too severe And then he looks at the audience and he says, what's wrong with you people? And he says, I'm serious. This is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is and we don't know who we are. The question is, why wasn't infinitely more severe? If we have any understanding of our sin, any understanding of who God is, that's the question. Or of one question that was posed to a church father many, many years ago, why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Why was a cross necessary? And the response was, oh, you don't understand the seriousness of sin. And in this tragedy, sin arrives. And when sin arrives, sin brings death. That's the third great enemy The third great enemy on display here is death. The Lord said, when you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll surely die. And because of God's grace, he didn't take Adam on the day that he ate the fruit. But death did come into the world. And that's on display in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, when Cain kills his brother Abel. And we see the first death. And then Genesis chapter 5 tells us in verse 5, Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. Death shows up here. Our third great enemy. You know, our congregation has faced this enemy a lot this year. More people within Orland Park CRC have died this year than any other year in my ministry. I know it's been a relatively brief ministry, but yet, in the course of five years, this is the one where the most amount of deaths has been visited on the congregation, and by a not insignificant margin, by not a small percentage. You know, this past week alone, we felt the sting of our enemy death. Rick Schultz and Mark Smith both. They both have experienced what we will all experience if the Lord tarries. Death. Our third great enemy. You know, there's a lie. There's a lie that exists within our culture. I hear it more often than I I would imagine. Here's that lie. People will say, you know, death is natural. Death is good. That's a lie. Death is not natural and death is not good. Death is not the way that it is supposed to be. Death is not the way that the Lord created the world to be. Death is unnatural and death itself must be defeated. And it will be. 
Because in the midst of this tragedy, in the midst of this terrible tragedy in Genesis chapter 3, there is the radiant beam of hope that shines through. Don't miss the hope that's present here in Genesis chapter 3, especially in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. There is an immense and an incredible hope that exists here in this tragic story. Don't miss it. Here's verse 15. The Lord speaks to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. While you devil might strike at the heel of the son of the woman, he is going to crush your head. There is going to come the one who will be the answer to all three of our great enemies, to sin, to death, to the devil. One is coming and that one is our hope. And that hope is Jesus. Jesus is our hope. This is what we come to realize during Advent. That Jesus is our hope. It's so good that we can remember during Advent that we have an everlasting hope. And that this hope is Jesus Christ. Because there is one and there is only one who can defeat each of our great enemies. Jesus. He defeats Satan. Here's how he does it. Revelation chapter 12 says that at the birth of Jesus, the devil hoped to stop the birth of Christ from happening. Let me read to you the first four verses of Revelation chapter 12. We're told, we're told in Revelation chapter 12, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars from heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. You see, the enemy knew that this child was to be his undoing. It had been prophesied in the garden. The seed of the woman will crush your head even as you strike at his heel. And Christ did defeat our great enemy at the cross. At that moment where Satan reached out to strike at the heel of our Savior, his head was crushed by the cross of our Savior Jesus Christ. He's defeated our first great enemy. And when he returns again, he will defeat him ultimately. Revelation chapter 20 promises to us the eternal end of this liar, of this deceiver. And Jesus defeats sin as well. Our second great enemy. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 tells us this. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. You see, at the cross, he defeated sin as well. If you trust in Jesus, if you trust in Jesus, it means that all of your sin has been placed upon Him at the cross. My sin, oh the bliss of that glorious thought, right? My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. As Christ went to the cross, He did it to bear your sin and mine. To bring an end to it. You know, our second great enemy now has no more control over us. And he defeated death. Forgive me. 
I've been struggling with this all week. Christ has defeated our third great enemy as well. You see, Christ died. Christ gave himself to this third enemy, to death. He died. And death was not powerful enough to keep our Savior down. On the third day, Christ rose again from the dead. And he defeated death. And while we still struggle, while we still struggle with it and against it, it's only for a time. All of its power is gone. For those of us who are in Christ, now, now death is just it's a doorway to eternal life for us. It's, it's not a final or an enduring enemy. It's, it's a doorway to eternal life. He defeated death. Jesus says in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Christ has power over death. He defeats all of our great enemies. I love the way that John Donne puts it in one of his holy sonnets. Would you pull up this quote? I think this is beautiful. This is a portion of his poem. He says this, I believe, in line with, with 1 Corinthians 15, which allows us to taunt our great enemy, death. Here's what John Donne writes. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee. Mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy picture be, much pleasure then from, much, from thee must much, more, must much more flow. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. And then here's the end of the poem. This is beautiful. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Christ defeats all of our great enemies. And in this, he is our hope. He is our hope. And so as we conclude, let's remember that like with so many things, this Christmas season is a season that was created to focus our attention on Christ and the hope that he brings as our Savior, the one who defeats sin and death and the devil, and yet it is a time where it can be terribly easy to forget him. You know, during a time of gift giving, and as we approach the end of the year, it can be a time where our hope becomes in things that are temporal and passing away. We can hope chiefly for a raise at work, or we can hope for the perfect family time, or we can hope for a white Christmas, or treetops that glisten, and sleigh bells in the snow, or we can hope for two front teeth, or you might say, all I want for Christmas is you, or you might hope for an official Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock, or a leg lamp, or a hundred other gifts you might hope for during the Christmas season. And don't get me wrong. It's fine and good to give gifts and to receive gifts during this season, but please don't let your hope be these things that you might give or receive. Let your hope be the one who defeats all of our great enemies. Let your hope be in the one who defeats the devil. Let your hope be in the one who has brought an end to sin. Let your hope be in the one who destroys death. This Christmas season, let's hope in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you bring an end 
to all of the enemies that are on display in Genesis chapter 3. We praise you that you have power over the enemy, over Satan. That you have crushed his head even as he's struck at your heel. We thank you that you bring an end to sin, that at the cross, the sin of all those who trust in you has been removed from us and placed upon you. And we thank you that you, that you destroy death and that death itself will die. Please be our hope during Advent and always, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.